species of mantle, that different processes have been evolved to end up with that shape. But there's no guarantee the fragments have any link to the killer. Like most people, Arlene was a product of her environment. The example I often use is, is, is Pigpen on Charlie Brown. He walks around and he's got this little cloud of dust. Well, we all have a cloud of dust, but everybody's cloud of dust is different. Could these metal fragments have come from the shop where Arlene worked as a seamstress, perhaps to make a zipper or button? Unlikely, but detectives need to rule it out. Someone who works as a seamstress uh, would not be expected to have metal fragments anywhere in her environment. A thorough search of Arlene's workspace confirms McAdam's hunch. There's nothing at the shop that would throw off these tiny fragments. McAdam is determined to find out. He again looks at the fragments under a microscope. And this time, McAdam sees they might point to a familiar suspect. When I saw the spheres, that made me speak of someone who was polished and grinding. So when the sparks come off when you're polishing a piece of metal, they, as they travel through the air, form spheres. So it made me think that someone who was uh, exposed to either uh, grinding and polishing operations or to cutting lathe-like operations, that's where this had come from. Could the fragments have come from someone like Gary Ackley? He works as a machinist in a tool shop, shaping and polishing metal. There was a lot of metal work that went on there, welding, uh, grinding, uh, drilling, um, those types of things. That was kind of the, the kind of work he did. But even if the fragments from Gary Ackley's shop match those found at Arlene's home, it doesn't prove he killed her. There's simply no way to determine when the fragments were left behind. Ackley could claim he stopped in to see Arlene almost any time. The fact that Ackley smoked the same brand of cigarettes found in Arlene's bathroom doesn't make him a killer either. There was an enormous amount of suspicion, but I, I'm proud to say that enormous amounts of suspicion doesn't rise to the level of the filing of charges in this jurisdiction. And so we wanted to make sure that we could be certain that Gary Ackley was responsible. We were getting really close to Gary. In other words, close to you know, building to an arrest. We didn't have what we needed yet. That is not a very comfortable feeling. The last thing we want is someone else victimized by this person. Yet we, we weren't in a position of effecting an arrest yet. In the following weeks, detectives continued to put together a case against Gary Ackley. Then, on August 10, 1997, Graddon's worst fears are realized. Campers and their dogs settle in for the night outside of Skycomish, Washington. The dog continues to play with a bone he had found in the woods. The next morning then, uh, by the light of day, were they able to see that it was half of a woman's pelvis. And there were a pair of panties wrapped around this bone that this dog had dragged into the camp the night before. Horrified and scared, the campers contact the King County Sheriff's Office. Sergeant Graddon is immediately dispatched to the scene. Graddon arrives a short time later to what appears to be the scene of another homicide. We see an anomaly that's on the floor of this forested area, and it's something under branches in this swale next to a downed tree. As we unlayer the brush off of this anomaly, we realize that what we're looking at is a faux leopard skin, in essence, with dots on it. Graddon has discovered a leopard print coat, and a few feet from the coat, the decomposed remains of a woman. There is no obvious cause of death, but it appears she is the victim of foul play. The condition of the body and remote location lead Graddon to suspect there might be a connection to Arlene Jensen's murder. One month after the body of Arlene Jensen is discovered, a second victim is found in the area. 
But detectives with the King County Sheriff's Office have only one potential suspect, the first victim's future son-in-law, Gary Ackley. The challenge will be tying him to both crimes. Sergeant James Gratton and a team of crime scene investigators searched the campsite where the second body was found. We continue our broad search again of this whole area, collecting what we can in the way of evidence. It would appear that she actually had some camping equipment that she had left there. We gathered quite a bit of, of evidence from that scene. The second victim appears to be a camper, but there is no identification or wallet among the remains. Investigators collect evidence from the scene, including the victim's leopard print coat and her camping equipment. Due to the advanced stage of decomposition, the coroner is unable to determine the cause of death. However, he confirms it's a homicide. Dental records identify the woman as 29-year-old Stephanie Dietrich. Stephanie's good friend Lee Pereira learns of her death through a mutual friend. He remembers Stephanie as spontaneous and full of life. At the time, we both thought, eh, she probably just found some place to go and just went off on a road trip because she liked to just get up and go places sometimes on the spur of the moment. But when another friend tried to get in touch with Stephanie at her home, it became clear her disappearance had nothing to do with an adventurous spirit. She left her wallet and her money at home on her bed. She would certainly have taken her identification and her money with her if she went somewhere. Detective Gratton believes Stephanie Dietrich's death could be related to the murder of Arlene Jensen. To confirm his suspicions, he sends Stephanie's clothes to forensics expert Terry McAdam for analysis. We look through the clothing from the autopsy. At this point, we did have the advantage of knowing that a person of interest was a metal worker. We indeed looked at that and did find metals of similar types, shapes. In fact, the metal fragments removed from Stephanie's leopard print coat appear to be nearly identical to those found in Arlene Jensen's house and on her fleece jacket. Gratton thinks he knows the source. Arlene Jensen's future son-in-law, Gary Ackley. But how is Ackley connected to the second victim, Stephanie Dietrich? The Sheriff's Department issues a Crime Stoppers bulletin asking anyone with information about Stephanie's death to come forward. One tip in particular seems promising, from a young man camping in the same area where Stephanie's body was found. This area is so remote that he remembers that there was no one else around. He remembered seeing his car. The vehicle the witness saw was a red Toyota sedan. The witness later saw a man and a woman walking from the woods toward the same red car. The woman seemed oddly dressed for a camping trip. He sees a man with long, long dark hair who's holding the hand of a woman who's dressed in a leopard skin coat. From the eyewitness description, it appears the woman in the leopard print coat could be the second victim, Stephanie Dietrich, and Gary Ackley has long dark hair. But does he own a red Toyota? Sergeant Gratton checks with the state's Department of Licensing and discovers Ackley actually owns two cars, the bronze Pontiac Trans Am and a red Toyota.